Welcome to another episode of The Inquisitive Analyst. I'm your host, Marcus Utekang. It's the show where we chat with business analysts and project managers about their challenges and triumphs, their ideas, and their contributions to their field. It's inspiring, it's upbeat, it's exciting, but most of all, well, it's inquisitive. My guest today is founder and CEO of Elements.Cloud. He's also a tech advisor, investor, and speaker, and he's authored about 10 books. Please help me welcome to today's show, Ian Gotts. Welcome, Ian. Um, hi there. And so, Ian, uh, perhaps I should start by saying you've had this extensive experience as an IT director. You've been vice president of a, of a software company, chairman, CEO, CIO of corporations. And you've also been a speaker at Salesforce's Dreamforce conferences. So let's, uh, let's start with the obvious. How did you get into the IT field and what gave you the incentive to become a director, CEO or CIO? Uh, so how did I get into the IT field? I was an engineer by training and then I started working for Accenture or Anderson Consulting as it was then, which was a business consulting, but then it turned into more IT consulting. So I had a fantastic 12 years there working in manufacturing um, in, and aerospace and defense. And I, I actually, my business analysis goes back to the very first time I joined. My first ever project, I was mapping out the business processes for an MRP2 or ERP as it now, is now, using I think AutoCAD. So I was trying to map out in a hierarchical way using sort of the SSA DM approach, mapping out how an ERP system worked so we could implement uh, that application at British Aerospace. So that's where I started in Accenture. I uh, had 12 years there where I grew very quickly, as you do. Um, one of the projects I had near the end, I, they'd seconded me in to be the CIO of the largest government agency in the UK, the DSS. So I was responsible there for a team of 500 and we were developing fraud systems and uh, uh, a range of other applications. So, I mean, fantastic. I always remember with Accenture, someone said, you, you could either get one year's experience in 10 or 10 years experience in one. And Accenture, Accenture was definitely the other one. You got 10 years experience in one but you were surrounded by amazing people. So the, the mentors you had, the if you just looked around you, the coaches you had were fantastic. So whilst you were growing fast, you never felt you were drowning. So fantastic, yes. Uh, I know Accenture did change its name some time ago and uh, it's, it's actually an honor to work for Accenture. I never have myself, but everyone that I know who's worked for them uh, has felt quite, quite good about it. So uh, you're a founder of Elements.Cloud. What's Elements.Cloud all about? Uh, well, so following on from the last point, um, uh, after I left Accenture, I set up a company called Nimbus Partners, which was business process mapping. We were, we were defining the business processes, mapping them out for highly regulated Fortune 500 organizations. And that got acquired by Tibco. And I got the guys back out of retirement. I got the band back together. And we set up Elements.Cloud, uh, which essentially is, was started off by, let's define the business processes. And because we've been a Salesforce customer since 2001, we recognize that Salesforce's customers had the same challenge. You're about to implement Salesforce, uh, infinitely configurable, hugely powerful, but unless you understand how your business processes work, it's very difficult to configure it, to configure it correctly uh, and make sure it really works. So we built out that process mapping cap capability I was looking the other day that with over half a million process diagrams have been drawn in the last few years uh, yeah. by the Salesforce folks. But as we got into Salesforce more and more, uh, the customers started saying, that's great, Ian, but if you could also tell us what we've configured, because we made all these configuration, all these changes, but we have no visibility of them, could you somehow do something with that? So Elements has grown from being just more than business process mapping and business analysis. It's now grown into an understanding about how the changes in, that you make to the business process are affecting the Salesforce configuration by building this metadata dictionary. Um, so it's been very interesting with all businesses I've been involved in several startups, where you start is not necessarily where you end up. If you listen to the customer, you end up take, getting taken in some very different directions. Um, so that elements.cloud, basically with our, our views, you shouldn't be making to ch changes to Salesforce and being surprised by what the impact is you should be able to understand, manage that change cycle really quickly and have some good solid business analysis behind it. So there's that Salesforce component in elements.cloud. And just out of curiosity, you've explained a bit about how it works, but um, how, how big is it in the Salesforce world, just out of curiosity? Uh, 
if anyone talks about elements.cloud in the Salesforce world, you would have heard of us. Mm, okay. uh, so we are, uh, we've there are a couple of metrics. One, I said that there are half a million um, process maps that have been defined in this whole process diagrams defined. A lot of those are, are mapping out the Salesforce processes using, well, let me just take a sort of side note from it, using a principle or a, a notation called UPN, Universal Process Notation. It's been around for about 20 years. It's this idea of a hierarchical process mapping. So moving away some, from the concept of say flowcharts, but instead you've got eight to 10 boxes on a screen, you can drill down multiple levels of detail. So you can take quite complex processes and instead of having this like, 100 boxes on a screen, which it blows everyone's mind, instead you can go, okay, right, this is the overall business process. Okay, right, this area here called, I know, generate lead, drill down, right? And you can go down multiple levels, mm -hmm. you can link to supporting documentation. So then this, the content can be used to engage in end users, but also can be used for training. So that's one piece. Uh, another metric is how much of this of these Salesforce orgs have we analyzed? Uh, think about metadata changes, the, the configuration. Uh, we've been analyzed over a billion metadata items to date. So we've got a pretty good understanding about uh, the inner workings of many, many Salesforce orgs. And we're, we're growing really, really quickly at the moment because it, it's a clear need. Um, one of the things about Salesforce, amazingly fast to make changes, which is fantastic. The downside, amazingly fast to make changes. So it's very easy to go, let's just get in and make those changes without doing sufficient analysis. Uh, you make the changes quickly, you move on, you forget why those changes were made. You come back, make a change to a workflow, make a change to a, a field or a screen, and then it has unintended consequences. You didn't realize it was being used in a certain way. So that, that analysis we're doing is also almost building that, an automated view of documentation. Someone said it's with the X-ray vision of someone's org. So how, how can business analysts and project managers really leverage this elements.cloud within Salesforce? You explained a bit about it. Uh, is there? Yeah, yeah, but if you think about any project, you've got project managers out there. If you're, so let me take a step back. It doesn't have to just be Salesforce. Okay. We've started with Salesforce, but we've built a platform that you could do it for any, you could, any business change. Okay. It could be simply an operational business change because of the way the business has changed due to COVID. It could be implementing Workday, implemented SAP. So it doesn't really matter, but okay. we'll take Salesforce as the example. Okay. You're about to implement, say, um, you need to uh, redesign the way you're doing your lead capture. You're no longer going to events. You're now doing... Um, you're now doing a lot more outbound reach. You're maybe working with uh, with partners to generate leads. So the whole lead process has got to change. So one approach is you dive straight into Salesforce and go, well, I think I know what we should do. We should change that field. We should add a new object. There's a new workflow. Oh, there's some new email templates over there. But the inquisitive analyst would say, actually, what do you really need? Not what do you want, but what do you really need? Let's no, get elements out. Let's start mapping the business process okay so tell me like what's the key process here right okay we're going to generate a lead okay how do i generate a lead what's the input from that okay what's the output okay it's a qualified lead okay well what's a qualified lead let's get be clear about that right now let's drill down and understand the, the detailed steps to get from inbound lead to qualified lead maybe we need to drill down two or three different levels to get to enough detail we can go right okay at this point we send out an email the, What's the email template like? Template. Oh, we can link that to the Salesforce email template. Okay. What's the critical workflow that kicks off? Oh, we can link that. So we're starting to connect the business processes, which the end users have helped us define, connect that back to what got configured inside Salesforce. Does that make sense? Yeah, that makes absolute sense. Yeah. No, that's quite quite good, quite fluid. Hmm. And so oh, uh, we're sorry. really with with the upgrade to flowcharting. People always talk about flowcharting. I mean, it's or oh, using Visio or PowerPoint. And, Think of us as the upgrade to that, version controlled, in the cloud, hierarchical. It, it's designed for the new world that we work in. Hmm, fantastic. So talking about the new world, where do you see Elements.Cloud say in five years from now in the marketplace? Well, it's interesting. If you'd asked me in 2015 and said, where do you think you'll be in five years? It wouldn't have been stuck, stuck in my phone <laughs> on Zoom call. So I think trying yeah. to predict five years from now is quite hard. Uh, where would I like it to be? Um, Certainly, Elements is growing very quickly. Um, there are 300,000 customers inside Salesforce. Uh, we're certainly not, uh, we're not in all of those customers. And there are a number of huge consulting firms who are starting to use us. So uh, five years from now, 
yeah, the standard around Salesforce, but also think about the other low code applications, think of the other configurable apps. We by then will have built the ability to do everything I've just talked about in Salesforce across all of those applications. Mm -hmm. So we're not just giving you the instrumentation about how Salesforce works, but for the CIO, it's across the whole business. These are the business processes that run the whole business and we're connected into ServiceNow, connected into Workday, into SAP. So suddenly you've got a true picture of how the business processes work and then how the IT system support it. Awesome. So you, you've explained some good examples of the processes that on the stock cloud. And how would you say that they're easy to understand? If I were, say, a layman, uh, how would you say these processes are easy to understand? Oh, well, first of all, the, sta the, 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 the standard, this thing called UPN, I said it's been around 20 years. We've proven that it's, it's aimed at end users. I mean, clearly there are some more complex notations like BPMN, but they're designed not, or UML, they're designed for maybe, maybe the technologist. This idea of a simple input and activity box and output, and we, every activity starts with a verb, you know, generate lead, qualify uh, opportunity, you know, review contract. So they're in very simple terms, number one. Number two, they are, it's only about eight or 10 boxes on a screen. I always think the confused mind says no. You look at 30 boxes and you're like, mm, I'm not gonna do that. You look at these complex things with lots of swim lanes that don't flow left to right, and it gets confusing. So the, the trick here is, is designing it so it's I know, eight or 10 boxes on a screen, simple left to right flow, terminology that the, the business user would be able to understand. And if they want to know more detail, click on the paperclip and it will then launch, I know, the web page, the, the notes. So think of this as online training material. Um, and with Elements, yeah, we're, we're helping build this out for company after company. But my, the last company I ran, Nimbus, we were the global standard at a Nestle or a Chevron or a, um, AstraZeneca, Bank of Montreal. So this principle of mapping out the business processes so that the end users can look at them is not new. We've, we've just put it in a, in, a, in a cloud context. But there's one other kicker that comes with this, which is if you're in a highly regulated industry, as you well know, if you haven't defined how you're operating, the, the auditors will come in and ping you. So therefore, there's a driver here to say, have you documented what you're going to do, number one, and number two, are your staff following it? And if you think about a, a new industry that's been growing very quickly, something like process mining, and there are companies like Salonis, they are, they are telling you how well your staff are following those processes. So if you've got something like a Salonis there doing the process mining, and then elements over here, so they're defining what's currently happening. We're defining what should happen. The gap is how much you get fined by the regulators. Mm -hmm. So there's, uh, there's, a, there's a really good reason for doing this. It's not just so we can define the business processes to configure software. It's so that we provide the guidance for end users to understand what they're doing. And it, which is even more important where we're all uh, working remotely. Fantastic. So let's let's look at the automation side of Elements.Cloud. You've talked a bit about that somewhat. Any, can you get a bit deeper about, so can you explain a bit about the automation within Elements.Cloud uh, at, at, a, at a deeper level, I guess, maybe if you want. Okay, so when you think about automation, quite often people think about how do I drive automated business processes? We don't do that that there are plenty of applications out there that do that there's there's no shortage of you know, there's automation sitting in salesforce there's I mean, companies like nintex or Dell there are there, there are plenty of automation players and even and then at the, the sort of the really granular level something like a zapier or an integromat those sorts of products are very good at automating processes there's no point us doing that uh, we're all about defining how those processes should be worked and then so but our level of automation uh, in our world is about how we drive through the workflow sign-offs, how we drive versioning. So there's no automation of process, but we have automated the process of process improvement. Okay. Uh, and yeah, the beauty is we can connect with any automation player. What we're trying to do is make sure that you build the right things and then the automation players can build them right. So where does continuous improvement come into play in Elmas.com? Well, it's very difficult to improve if you don't have a baseline. So the, the starting point is, do you have a baseline? Do you understand how you should be working? 
So I think for many organizations where they've got I know, a pile of documents sitting somewhere, either gathering dust on a hard disk or gathering dust on a, on a shelf somewhere, those processes are, are so out of date. So the first act of right, I mean, maybe it's a digital transformation is forcing organizations to rethink their processes. Maybe this is the first time they really start to define the processes end to end, engaging the stakeholders. So you get some continuous, you get some first improvement from getting people together remotely, but getting together online to say, okay, talk us through the end to end process here and capturing it live in live workshops with maybe something like elements. So that starts, you, you drive immediate improvements out of that. You have people on the call going, oh, I didn't realize you did that. I, well, we shouldn't be doing that at all. This is how it should work. So the, f the first act of doing those workshops, if they're well facilitated, you end up driving some improvements. But now you've got a platform for change. So again, any elements diagram, click in the right hand corner, click on the feedback, and then that will drive uh, a discussion with the, the process owner. Then they can say, okay, here are some ideas that, that can be improved. And if you think about this hierarchy of process diagrams, big change comes top down. Uh, we need to implement a uh, configure price quote. We need to completely rethink our front end uh, engagement with customers because of digital transformation. They're the big changes that come top down. But I also remember Toyota used to talk about everyone doing their job 1% better every day. So you get lots of little change happening at the lower levels where someone goes, oh, I found a better way of uh, sending out that, out that email campaign. So you need a place to capture those changes as well. So what we find is that this hierarchy of process diagrams, the top level cycles more slowly, but the, top, the lower levels, you look at the versioning of those diagrams, they go around more quickly. And maybe it's a smaller group, it's just the marketing team, or it's just the custom success team have said, okay, we just need to tweak the way that template works. We need to uh, have a different call script. So those changes are happening at a, low, low, at a, a local level, but they all need to be coordinated. And that's why this hierarchy really works. Fantastic. Uh, just out of curiosity, risk, reduced project delivery risk, you say you have on elements.cloud. How, how is that so? Well, I mean, the, the biggest risk that I think you have is that making changes and having unintended consequences. So if you say, right, we're going to completely change the way we're doing I know, our lead capture process here, and we what we use is uh, we're going to create the, the opportunity record, say, in Salesforce, is the way we, we actually understand what the sales are. And the sales team are working with that and you work with them and they say we want to completely change that and we want some different stages for the way opportunity works and we want to do that. And the team go off and build that. And then the professional services team go, hey, hey, hey we use that too. So, Did you? Nowhere was that written down. We didn't realize. So the sales team have got their changes made, but we've now broken the way our professional services team work. So that risk is about understanding how the business processes work and then how the different people use those processes but then the underlying systems to make sure that they don't break because pretty much every company now runs on technology we're all reliant on those systems the bigger the company the more teams that are changing those systems at the same time that massively increases the risk but at the same time we want the changes to happen faster because we need to respond to the market changes more quickly so and a couple of things, unless we understand how to get that analysis done really quickly and engage people, unless we understand the implications of the change to the systems, going faster just means we break things faster. And I think that's the biggest challenge we have. It, it, the companies who can execute change well will be the ones that succeed. Uh, I think if we look back over the last year, um, some of the, the statistics, so like the, the speed that Walmart managed to transform no matter how, how large it was, transform to on in-store pickup to curbside pickup. Uh, they spun up new, new uh, call centers. They spun up new uh, delivery centers. Uh, one of our clients, a company called uh, Second Harvest um, Silicon Valley, which is a food bank, they went from feeding 180,000 people to feeding half a million people. Wow. They had to spool up really quickly. They had to pull in new volunteers. They had to build new systems for you know, vetting volunteers very quickly. So there were a whole series of things they had to do really quickly. Salesforce was the back end system. We were the front end business process. And then we gave them the analysis about what would, what would break if they made those changes to Salesforce. And they had a chance to build a, an ongoing platform. We, we think of ourselves as a management platform, but they started to build a platform 
with all the documentation, which means the next time they make changes, they've got a basis to work from. Oh, fascinating. So you're going to be speaking at this year's Dreamforce? I hear it's all online. Uh, I'm, I'm, again, Dreamforce will be in October. We've no idea whether it will or won't happen. Okay. I'm certainly speaking at a number of the Dreaming events. So there, in Salesforce, there are two groups. There's the, there's the corporate events, and I've spoken at a number of those. And I, that's Dreamforce. And, and then there are some big events that are run by the end users, um, by user groups called Dream Events. So I'm certainly I've spoken at a number of the Dreaming events, and I think they will probably come back more quickly than Dreamforce. Uh, if I think back, Dreamforce last year, well, it didn't happen last year. The year before was, what, 160,000, 170,000 people? It was it's sort of Disneyland meets a rock show, I think, probably <laughs> the, it's the best way of describing it. Fantastic networking opportunity. Whether we'll get to do that this year, I don't know. I hope we do. Uh, if I reflect back on my career around Salesforce, I was the speaker at the first London event back in, I think, 2001 or 2002. There were 130 people. There was Mark Benioff and three customers, and that was it. That's and it. what an amazing ride in 20 years, how far we've come. Yeah. 100, yeah. 130 people in London to uh, 160,000 in San Francisco. Yeah, that's incredible. Absolutely cool. So anyone wants to, in the audience wants to get in touch with you, how can they do so? Oh, it's pretty easy. Ian at elements.cloud. Or hit the website. There's a, a button there that says uh, uh, get in touch. Set up, a, set up a call. Uh, we're really happy to talk about not just the product, but um, I spend my whole time evangelizing the importance of business analysis, as you've heard today. So it's the, the principles are really important. Whether whether you use elements or not is another matter. We happen to think it's the easiest way of doing it, but I would say that. <laughs> so yeah, but come and talk to us. Um, there, we've got a blog there where I'm, we're constantly writing thought leadership articles about. Um, about the importance of, of business analysis, the importance of uh, reducing risk in making changes to Salesforce. So that's elements.cloud. And I'm Ian, I-A-N, at elements.cloud. Fantastic. This has been a fabulous conversation, and I've learned a lot in this short period of time. Just absolutely fantastic. Good evangelizing. Brilliant. Thank you so much for letting me come along. Oh, you're welcome. And uh, have yourself a wonderful day in sunny California, by the way. Okay, thanks. All right. Take care. Bye. Bye-bye.